Hi there, I'm Jim Zirin. Welcome back to more Conversations in the Digital Age. Our show is about the front-running Democratic presidential candidate, Hillary Clinton, who is rolling rapidly towards the Democratic nomination. Clinton has edged out primary victory after primary victory over her rival, Senator Bernie Sanders. She's won more votes in the primaries than any other candidate so far. She's amassed over 2.5 million more votes than Sanders, over 1.1 million more votes than Trump. Yet, despite her obvious strengths, polls show only 37% of Americans find her to be trustworthy. She numbers support from only 26% of white men. President Obama himself has acknowledged her weaknesses as a candidate, saying that many Democrats find she is not authentic. The good news for Hillary is that only 27% of Americans view the Republican frontrunner Donald Trump as trustworthy. Hillary is perhaps the most overly vetted candidate for president in U.S. history. She survives scandal after scandal, embarrassment after embarrassment, defeat after defeat, and investigation after investigation. A pastor said of her in a Michigan church recently that she knew how to take a lickin' and keep on ticking. With us is journalist and author Nina Burley, who has covered Hillary Clinton for the past 25 years, and few know Hillary as well as she does. Nina is Newsweek's national politics correspondent. She's an award-winning journalist and author of five books. Her latest book, The Fatal Gift of Beauty, The Trials of Amanda Knox, was a New York Times bestseller. Nina, welcome back. We're delighted to have you with us. Thanks, Jim. Now, um, you've been following her, uh, Hillary Clinton, for 25 years. And for most of us, she's, as Churchill said of the Russians, a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. What's your bottom line on her? And who are the Hillary voters? How rock solid is her support? Well, I mean, first of all, I haven't been following her consistently for 25 years. But I did, the first time I encountered her, she was on uh, uh, running for first lady. And I met her on a uh, very small jet flying around uh, Arkansas. And that, that Hillary Clinton was a friendly Midwestern, the Midwestern, Midwesterner from Park Ridge, Illinois, uh, still had a little bit of the Midwestern accent, was pretty open and approachable. This was during the Clinton, the first Clinton campaign. Uh, the second time I encountered her in person was at a table in the White House with another colleague of mine from Time Magazine, and we were interviewing her about the Whitewater case. And I cannot forget the steely glare in the look uh, in her eyes during that uh, interview. Uh, those are my two personal encounters with her. I've been writing about her and following her around off and on for years. Um, what's the bottom line? The bottom line is, as the pastor said, takes a licking and keeps on ticking. But I think more than that, she's the good girl who does her homework. She's, the, she's always been the... Uh, the girl in the in the front of the class with her hand up, the, the one that you kind of envy and want to help, have help you with your homework, um, but perhaps not the most charming and perhaps not the most politically astute person uh, to be running for president and, and front running the Democrats. Well, one of the complications in her political life has been her husband, President Bill Clinton. Uh, not only the past scandals, but uh, you take the CGI. 2008 primary and his comment about uh, Obama with regard to Jesse Jackson in South Carolina. Uh, most recently, uh, he uh, talked about uh, the awful legacy of the last eight years, uh, which uh, his, uh, Hillary's rivals have said uh, has to do with uh, so he's dissing Obama. Uh, the Clintonites came back and said, oh, no, he was talking about the Republican Congress, but they'd only been there for six years. So uh, what do you make of him? Is he a, a, a help or a hindrance to it? Well, that's, Politically. that's a complicated question, right? I mean, you could do a whole book on what to do about Bill. What is she going to do about Bill if she gets elected? What is, he, what is his role going to be in the White House? He has complicated her. He'll be Dennis Thatcher. He has Thatcher's. complicated her. The well, no, he's going to be something very different from Dennis Thatcher, I think. Um, he's complicated her career from the very beginning, and he complicates her career as he complicates her as a candidate for for women 
in this election and probably in 2008 because of the humiliation of the infidelity. He complicates her as a secretary of state. Uh, you know, the email scandal is really not, as far as I'm concerned, going to lead to anything. But what it has done is, is allowed those of us who want to pay attention to it to look at 30,000 emails that, that these people were, were exchanging with her. And you do see, you start to see, it's, it's, it's a goldmine for investigative journalists. You see these interactions between uh, donors to the Clinton Global Initiative and the handlers and the people around her at the, at secretary at the at the State Department, and those things will tag along with her for a very long time. I predict if, if the, the the email scandals nothing, it's 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 just trumped up, pardon the pun, mm -hmm. but the uh, but the 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 issue of having this powerful husband, the uh, ex president of the United States, in the White House with her. Uh, you know, where, where are they going to put him? Are they going to put him in the East Wing? Is he going to have his man cave? And will Putin come back there and smoke cigars with him? And will he be cutting the deals? I mean, these are these are problems that um, probably off cigars because of his uh, heart condition. That's right. They'll be sharing macrobiotic uh, dinners or something. But it's um, you know th those are just a few of the issues. And then you you know you've got the you've got the um, the way that he's. I mean, I think they call him to heal. Um, uh, during the campaign. I think they're, they've already done that a little bit. They try to deploy him where they think it's best. Getting white males out, obviously, is the way that they're going to deploy him. Um, but, yeah, it's complicated. It co complicated for many, many reasons. And that's one of the reasons why she's such an enigma. And that's one of the reasons why I think she went from well, personal, she has a personality of being a kind of a, a, in a protective crouch, but she went into a protective crouch during those years in the White House uh, because of, uh, first of all, her lightning rod position as a woman who wore pants in the White House and, a, you know, the first working woman in the White House, which looking back on it 25 years, it just seems so ridiculous and even humiliating that women were, were being judged that way at that time. The, the shoulder pad feminists, if you will. That's, that's not something that we really want to remember. Those of, those of us who are my age, slightly younger than she is, but older than the millennials, we don't really want to think about those years. We want to, we want to feel like that's in the past. And so to have, uh, she represents a lot of these things that are problematic, and, and those are the negatives. But I'm, I think she also has a lot of positives, and we can talk about that when you're ready. Well, in uh, 2008, uh, of course, she used her uh, maiden name, Rodham, Hillary Rodden Clinton, and it was a, an historic candidacy, the first woman in the White House. Now you don't see so much of that. Now she's Hillary Clinton, and the first woman in the White House is kind of downplayed, although she uh, recently said that she would be the youngest female president ever to be elected to the office of, uh, of President of the United States. Uh, so has there been a, a, a transformation in eight years? I think there's a transformation, but I think it's gone in the other direction, Jim. I think that they played down the womanliness in 2008, and they've consistently played it up in this election cycle. They have, from the very beginning, from the day that she announced on Roosevelt Island, she talked about her mother, she talked about her grandmotherly status. She, talked, she talks about pay equity for women. She talks about being the first woman president. And I think those issues are, um, they are going to be motivating for women who, at the moment, we see there's this kind of reluctance to, uh, or a sort of a lack of enthusiasm, let's say, among women for her. I think once we get into the actual election period, uh, the, the end of the, this very long campaign, um, Too long. Yes. Once we get into Clinton v. Trump, um, as one of my uh, colleagues said at, at another uh, at another magazine, it's going to be a cage match of sexism with Trump against Hillary. It's it's just going to be astounding. Well, if what the we're nominee going to is see. Trump. True. I mean, well, they we, that well, you know, brokered convention is all they can hope for now, right? Right. But what what um, would but what would you think a uh, Trump against Hillary debate would look like? Uh, a, uh, a correspondent will ask uh, her about 
Syria, and she'll say what she thinks about Syria or the Middle East, and uh, he'll say, no, I want to talk about Monica Lewinsky. Or, uh, I think I mean, there's going to be... Take the, the I think there's down into the gutter. I think there's going to be some of that. I think it'll go down in the gutter, and I don't know how she responds to that. Um, I think that she is... He's, he, he could do well in the debates because he comes off as much more um, open and, and funny and engaging, and, and she, she has uh, an authentically funny side and a, and a, and a, and a sarcastic side, and, and her sense of humor is said to be um, uh, sometimes profane and, and biting, and, and, and she, she, but she can't, as a woman running for president, this is the double mind that you're in. You can't talk. Uh, you can't talk that talk. You can't. Uh, so she's 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 limited in how uh, ferociously she can respond. I mean, you saw on you know two Tuesdays ago when she won Florida, the male punditry focusing not on the fact that she's riding the train to the, to the, to victory, but that she was yelling. She wasn't smiling. I mean, these are ridiculous things that are be that she's being judged on so many other platforms than the than the male candidate. And so, what's the, what is the debate going to look like? I think you know he comes across as more open. Um, yes, he's probably going to go to the gutter. And um, she, but you know, she's very smart, and I'm sure they will bring it back to things like Trump. You and you know he. he he can't, he can't debase her too much because he already, and polls are showing now, he already has alienated huge numbers of American women. And the, poll, the most recent polls show women going, breaking for Hillary against him in huge numbers. And he, he will not... Including he will millennial not win, women. Including millennial women who have been allegedly problematic for her. And I say allegedly because what, what's been problematic for her is not millennial women versus old women, the cat fight, the sexist cat fight. It's the millennial people who are voting for Sanders, male and female, are falling in. But once it... They're the ones who are 18 in the year 2000 or younger. Yes. And, you, and once, you see, once you see it, when it, once it comes down to Trump versus Clinton, Women are going to break for her. Millennial women are going to break for her. Young people will break for her, probably. Uh, but you know, again, the debate is—it's—it's it's going to be—it's uh, going to be fascinating to watch. Well, how is interesting she, times. How is she going to cope with his misogyny? I mean, is she just going to uh, sulk and uh, and walk off camera, or uh, is she? Uh, to say she won't debate him any further because he doesn't want to be serious, uh, or well, is she going to counterattack the way he likes well, to do? Well, I think I think I think the model for how she might behave is the eleven-hour showdown in the Benghazi hearing when she was when she sat there and let those senators just hang themselves. And in, you remember, at the end of the day, they were sweating and she was laughing. What do women uh, see in Hillary Clinton? Uh, of course, they, they see that uh, she's one of theirs, she's one of, part of their team, but uh, has she really done anything substantively for women? And that's a good question, Jim. Has she done anything sub substantive? Well, the, the Beijing speech, the, 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 the speech that everybody talks about in 1995 when the, the wife of the president of the superpower stood up in front of the world and said, women's rights are human rights, it was regarded as a seminal moment. And so globally, that and, and other, uh, her other interactions with women on a global uh, platform have made her an extremely important role model and figure for women globally. Within the United States, women are judging her in a different way. And I think we have a tendency to be more critical. Um, we have a tendency to, uh, we, have, we have all our own issues dealing with, with uh, the slow pace of progress for women here in the United States, not to mention in the world, but here in the United States. The fact that we always have our back to the wall on reproductive rights and have no time, uh, political capital to address other issues like pay equity or the lack of female representation in the C-suite, things like, things like that that, that uh, 
Um, she has not been able to move the ball on. You don't see her out there kicking the ball on it so much. Um, when I did a big, I did a big story on her uh, real record at Secretary of State early on, looking beyond Benghazi. What has she done? What did she do? And, and I was really interested in especially her interactions with Saudi Arabia because I thought while she was Secretary of State, boy, she sure could have gone out there and said something from the bully pulpit about, you know, our ally not allowing women to, to drive cars. I mean, that seems like a no-brainer. And people were passing around petitions, and she didn't step forward. What I, what I found was that she, her, her method of, of her, her, her modus operandi, and I think it will transfer into the White House, was that she made these personal uh, relations. She had personal relationships that she worked on with people like the king of Saudi Arabia, she was very charming. Um, she became friendly with them. And rather than get up and say, come on, uh, you know, in a public platform, let's let, why are you not letting women drive cars? What she was doing was if something bubbled up to her attention, let's say the five-year-old girl was about to be married off to the gross Uncle Fester, she would pick up the phone and call behind the scenes and say, excuse me, we don't approve of this. And then something would happen. So she was doing certain things behind the scenes, but she wasn't out in front. She did set up in the, in the uh, State Department a, an office for women's issues. And she did make a point of when she, I mean, she traveled an enormous amount, a million miles. Whenever she went to countries, she asked uh, to meet with women. So she brought women into the room. And I think that that's a big step, actually. I think that that's, a, that's important. And I think for women, for American women, um, just the fact that we are this close to having a female in the White House, the most powerful position in, in the world, uh, is is extremely important, and it's it's it makes her a kind of a revolutionary, in in a and she's kind of in a, in a way a, a reluctant revolutionary or a not very obvious revolutionary because she's so pragmatic in her approach, and she's so uncool in her pantsuits, right? She's a grandmother, but everything she does, every move she makes, at this point is de facto revolutionary because it's never been done before. There's never been a woman at that level of, of power, that close to power, and everything she does is being judged whether or not it's obvious or stated that, uh, that this is how she's being, she's being judged by that, by that being, being in that position, being the first woman in that role. And it's, it's very important for women. It's just that there are all of these other issues. There's so much baggage with being a Clinton, and she may not be the perfect female candidate, the perfect first female candidate for president. Well, she herself admits that uh, she's not the greatest of candidates. Uh, she's made that statement. Uh, and the crit But what is perplexing and often vexing is the criticisms of her seem to be so ill-founded uh, if you get into the facts, and they center around buzzwords like emails, Benghazi, mm -hmm. the Clinton Foundation, mm -hmm. uh, and not so much on what I think is her true uh, vulnerability, which is the way she shifted positions. Mm -hmm. Not an evolution of positions, which every politician is entitled to, but uh, dramatic about-faces on gay marriage, mm -hmm. on trade, uh, on other well, Clinton, I'm oh, sorry, Obama came around dramatically on gay marriage, I think, too, right? That's true, but uh, yeah. two wrongs don't make a right. Right. But, I mean, she said it was, uh, on the floor of the Senate, it was her heartfelt uh, belief that marriage should be reserved uh, to a man and a woman. Right, and that is very alienating for millennials, for whom this is such a non-issue. But you're right, on, let's say, the TPP, um, you know, Sanders has pushed her, uh, pushed her in a certain direction. The, the whole interaction with Wall Street, the speeches to Goldman, um, the taking the money from, from Goldman Sachs, the, the, her, her, pre, her, her position as a member in good standing of the establishment 
in, in, in a year when on both sides there's this, there's this roar of opposition, the pitchforks and the, and the, uh, the torches against the establishment, and she very much is a member of the establishment. She's Davos. She's, uh, you know, she's Goldman Sachs. She's she is the establishment. But she says she's non-establishment. And she's a woman. I mean, that being I mean, is Queen Elizabeth part of the establishment? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> she's she's a member. She's she is a member in good standing of the establishment. And uh, for better or worse. That is what the way that we can expect her to operate. We, she will be operating uh, more of the same, maintain course. I don't. I mean, and I think she will be more establishment than uh, Obama has been on the uh, foreign policy issues. She's much more of an interventionist than he is. That's what. That's the problematic part of the Libya, uh, the Benghazi story, is that she was. She's. She's ready. And willing, and will be able to to uh, to shoot a couple of tomahawks into uh, or send people into uh, Syria or Libya or where where you know we might want to uh, have uh, more influence and and uh, you know regime change. Well, all the regimes have already all changed, but getting involved in those in those so more adventures. Of an more of an interventionist foreign policy. Well, sure, and and you know. And how does she deal with China? She, uh, of course, was the author of the pivot toward China, which uh, never really was successful, and now we're having more problems with China than we ever had. Well, um, I think you're probably better off asking Richard Haas that <laughs> question. <laughs> I'm not well, so up to speed on the Asian, uh, on the Asian stuff. I mean, yeah, she did pivot to China, and she did, you know, everything that she did as Secretary of State, though, Jim, was at the behest of the president. I, I mean, I, looking into her her years there, I, I don't see that she was spearheading a whole lot of of activity that wasn't already approved, signed, sealed, and delivered from the White House. Well, getting back to uh, the, uh, the female aspect, uh, female leaders, political leaders, Margaret Thatcher uh, and uh, Angela Merkel, uh, much more beloved abroad than uh, in uh, their own country. And this would be true of Hillary as well, would it not? That may be true of all leaders, though. I don't know. Is that a sex? Is that a gender-based thing? I'm not sure. I'm, is Thatcher more beloved outside? I mean, was she more beloved outside than inside? I mean, she. Oh, got, I think she was revered elected. in the United States, for example, the Iron Lady. And uh, but while in, in, in England, uh, she had many, many detractors. And, right, uh, but I think she had detractors here too. But I think comparing Hillary to let's say Merkel or Christine Lagarde, let's say these European kind of. These are these efficient kind of mother types, um, uh, women who are, uh, who, you know, who can, who can be, uh, they're stolid and trustworthy and, and uh, people who can get the job done. I think she fits into that to some extent. Um, I think that's the type of, of, uh, of um, uh, policy maker and leader that she is. I think she fits into that, uh, but I don't know, I don't know whether... Um, she will be any, I mean, again, you know, I, I, I believe that globally she is uh, a revered figure in a way that she, the American women don't, uh, don't react the same way. We're much more critical of her. Is she authentic? Fairly or not. What is meant by authentic? The president said she's, Obama said she's not authentic. A lot of people say she's not authentic. Yeah, well, I've written about that, and that is, that is problematic for women. It's very specifically problematic for women. She, what is authentic? Is Trump authentic? You know, I mean, nobody says Trump isn't authentic, and, and every other word is, every other sentence, there's something that's false is coming out of his mouth. So what's authentic? Well, so authenticity for women is uh, a very big problem because she can't, if she speaks loudly, if she speaks forcefully, which is what people want their president to be, a dominating individual, uh, then she has a problem she's offending people because that's not how women are supposed to behave. So if she reigns in the instinct to be loud or to be dominating, then she seems inauthentic if that's what she really is. And since she is a leader, she is a powerful person, but she has to restrain that in order to 
be acceptable and that act the very act of restraining the dominating and, and powerful within is an inauthentic uh, it, it may appears inauthentic. So okay, so stuck. Nina Burley, we have to wrap up, but I have a question for you, and the question is, will Hillary Clinton have the trust of the American people? Uh, I believe she will if she's you up believe against she Trump. Will. Nina I don't know Burley. about Trump. I think she'll. I, I think she'll be elected if if she uh, runs she, against Trump. Well, if she's elected, it'll mean she's won their trust. So Nina Burley. Thank you so much for coming by. This has been You're just welcome. wonderful. Many more things I have to ask you, and I know I will one day. And thank you for coming by. Tune in next week for more Conversations in the Digital Age. I'm Jim Zirin. All the best, and take care.